Everyone's going on. Welcome to a special edition of the podcast. Special guest today. It's a little bit outside of our normal realm, but uh, you know, I think there's a great story here. And uh, so I want to introduce Trevor to the podcast. Trevor, what's going on? Can you introduce yourself and give like the one minute, 30 second Reader's Digest for people who don't know who you are and what you do? Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Trevor Lane from LakersNation.com. I cover the Los Angeles Lakers for for Lakers Nation. I also I host the Lakers Nation podcast. I do most of their YouTube content, and uh, and so we just have a good time talking Lakers basketball and breaking everything down from an analytics standpoint, and uh, and also write articles for for the website as well. So uh, a lot of fun getting to cover what was my favorite team growing up, the Lakers. And uh, it, look, it's been quite a journey getting here. Well, I'm excited. It's the first time for us to like sit down and connect, but I just know there's a lot of people that would look to what you do now and they're like, man, I want to be like Trevor. So I kind of want to like rewind the, 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 the clock a little bit because now, you know, you have all this stuff going on, but I want to kind of take it back to how you got started in this industry. And like, what did you, and like, I, it was like your comic book episode zero. Like, what did you want to do growing up? And then is it what you're doing now? Sure, my my origin story. Um, you know, growing up, I I initially wanted to get into into teaching, and uh, and that's something I actually did and, and still do. But um, but you know what? I, I also wanted to write. That was the other thing that I wanted to make sure that I did was was kind of have that creative outlet. And so I started a few different novels and things like that. And just I would get like halfway through an idea or get into something, and and I would never finish it because my attention was always getting pulled by NBA rumors and reading Lakers stuff and all that. And I'm like. I got to write what I love. And so I started writing, uh, started my own blog and just giving analysis on Lakers basketball and that sort of thing. And then uh, I got picked up by one website. And, and so I was writing there a little bit. And then I got brought into Lakers Nation, which is a, a gigantic platform. It blows me away. And uh, and they had me writing one article a week uh, originally. And that was uh, four or five years ago. And it's just grown from there. Every time there's been an opportunity, I've jumped at it. So I went from from just writing into podcasting and doing audio content and now into video content and editing their video as well. So it's, uh, it's grown quite a bit, but it's letting me, it's let me do a lot of really, really fun things. And, um, you know, it's certainly a, an opportunity that I was glad that I jumped at. So to, to kind of rewind things a little bit. So you said you were, and you currently do teaching. Is that what you went to school for? Where did you go to school and, and did you study education? Yeah, so I went to uh, I went to school at Concordia University in Irvine, California, mm -hmm. and my uh, I got a bachelor's degree in history and political science, and so I wanted to do that was was teach history, and uh, and I think it all comes back to storytelling though. It's, I I loved being able to tell all the great stories from history. That's my favorite part of it. Grading papers and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, thanks. But but to get to to go tell a bunch of stories about you know uh, about George Washington crossing the Delaware and and things things like that. Just the cool moments in history always excited me and that kind of translates into sports as well you know you think about all these these great moments that we get to talk about kobe's final game robert ory hitting the three and in, in 02 and, and stuff like that that uh, that i get to now talk about with fans so there is definitely a link between the two things but you know sports wasn't initially what i went to school for it's just something that i kind of gradually evolved into so so when you say you taught did you teach high school middle school are you still teaching what's been your history of employment in teaching yeah, so actually, I'm I am still teaching, okay. I, and uh, so I do both both jobs. I basically have two full time jobs, and at some point, I will probably get cut down to down to one. But especially given what's gone on in the sports world, I'm glad that I've got uh, got another source of of income. But um, but yeah, so I I teach uh, junior high, so okay. I've got eighth graders, and then I and then I coach sports for them as well, and I've coached basketball and soccer and volleyball and all these different things. So. That kind of gives me a physical outlet uh, in, in addition to everything else. What do your students think? Like, do they, they know what you do? They got to know, right? Because I imagine your classroom is like all Lakers stuff. and Yeah, yeah. They found out um, a couple of years ago. They found out and it spread on quick. I never discussed it or talked about it or anything, but somebody found me on Twitter. They saw the little blue check mark and they thought that meant I was a celebrity or something like that. And I'm like, no, guys, you know, I just, hey, I, I do this basketball an analysis stuff. And this is just, you know what? There's tons of teachers that have, other jobs this is my other job i go and i i talk about basketball and that's and that's what i do so they um uh, they like it there's some kids who will who will talk about oh i heard you say this on the podcast and they'll try and go back and forth with me about basketball and stuff like that but um you know what they they it's just kind of part of of who i am and and they're cool with it that's cool so 
to, to rewind things a little bit, you said you started, you're like, okay, I've been wrote, wrote all these novels. Did you ever finish any of the novels that you started? No, man, I had, I had all these uh, different concepts and ideas of things that I was going to write all the different young adult novels that were like adventure series and stuff like that. And, and I got, you know, I would get halfway through it and I've just, it just couldn't keep my attention because I was so busy looking to see, Hey, are the Lakers going to trade for this guy? What's going on with the salary cap here? And I'm like, you know what? I'm going about this all wrong. I enjoy writing. It's a great creative outlet, but I've got to write what I'm really focused on. And that's, and that's basketball. And so that allowed me to, to really zero in. And that's, that's changed my writing completely. And for context, you said you started a blog roughly like what year was that when you started a blog? Uh, Jeremy Lin was a Laker at the time. Okay. So it was, uh, I want to say it was 2014, 20, okay. it was the 2014, 2015 season. So it's, uh, it's gone from there. Okay. So you're not, I mean, that's pretty recent. Like when you're talking like, I was thinking like OG blog of like 2008, 2009, but no, I mean, that's like within the past six years, you went from not having a sports presence online to having a big sports presence online. Um, what? Yeah, what, that's, that's accurate. I mean, well, I, back when I was in college, I used to write about pro wrestling. And so I had a weekly column on uh, a pro wrestling website and I kind of fell out of love with that. So I had a little bit of experience in there. Actually, I wrote for NBA.com for a season about fantasy basketball. And so I had done that, but I'd kind of gotten out of it. And then I jumped back in when I started up my, my blog. So I bounced around a little bit, but uh, I like to think I, you know, I'm here to stay now. What was the name of your first blog? What was, I said that again? What was the name of your first blog? First blog. Yeah, it was the uh, the un it was the Unpasa blog, which was based on a, a username that I had on a lot of different fantasy basketball websites, and uh, and so I had a few people that were reading that. It was really just it was a test. It was a test for me to see, okay, you know, can I if I'm going to write basketball, am I going to stick with it? Let me jump on this and let me write for six months, seven months before I try to go anywhere else. I knew eventually I was going to want to try to link up with a bigger site, and then once I felt like I had a decent backlog of content where I could show them, hey, this is this is my work. This is what I do. And then I could st use that as sort of like a, a resume. So it was never created with a, any eye towards being a long-term thing. It was more just, Hey, let me build up sort of a portfolio and, and then go from there. So, so you said you wrote for like six to seven months when you first started, was there any readership at all? Like did some, did you have some readership from the other places you had written or was, did you start from literally like square one? I was pretty much starting from scratch. I want to say I had like 250 300 followers on twitter or something like that you know it wasn't wasn't anything significant so i was you know it wasn't any major readership or, or anything like that it was more hey look i can do this i you know i i, I read all the you know adrian wojnarowski and mark stein like mark stein was my favorite growing up i would read him nonstop, and bill simmons and all and i'd read those guys and think you know i can do this i can i can write you know not to that caliber maybe but i can get there someday and so it was more, I wanted a, a backlog of work that I could show people and say, Hey, if you're willing to take the chance on me, I'll put in the work. And so I did, I worked for free for my first, uh, my first year. I, and then, and I just wrote and, uh, and it was just a, an opportunity to get out there and prove myself. And you when know, you, when fortunately you said you, it worked out. You worked for free. Did you work for free for yourself on your blog or you worked for another outlet for free? Did you work for I Laker went to another outlet? And, and I worked for, for free for them. And then I went to, to Lakers Nation and they started paying me, but it was just on a trial basis. It wasn't anything significant. I think I was making $25 an article, write one article a week and and do that. And that was and that was it. But it was just, you know, hey, we'll take a shot on you and we'll see if it if it works out. Unfortunately, it uh it has. And then so for you, when you look at that year of working for free. What did that, what did you get from that that allowed you to make a jump to, to a Lakers nation? Like when you say, okay, Hey, look, I, I grinded for a year, you know, like, was it worth it? Or like, what did you take away from that? Cause a lot of people are like, man, I'm not going to work for a year for free. And so I guess like a couple questions, one, what was your physical output, the work you were doing? And then two, what did you take from that experience? So I, in terms of what I did, I started initially when I got picked up by another outlet, which was, uh, I'll just say it is silver screen and roll. Mm -hmm. When I got picked up by them, um, my initial output was the same. It was, Hey, can you give us one article a week? And I came in right around the same time as another guy that a lot of people that are, you know, on the, the basketball Twitter universe know that's Harrison Fagan. Um, he and I came in similar times. He had been on for, I think six or seven months or something before I came in. 
and he always approached things from a journalism side. He had things from a, he looked at things from that perspective. He had a journalism degree. So working alongside with him, um, I always looked at it from a storyteller's perspective. And so we kind of rubbed off on each other in that way where I got to look at it as, hey, you know, journalistically, you need to be able to say this, this, and this. You, you, the way you title an article is this way and all that. So I picked up a ton of things from him. And so I certainly learned a lot there. And then as things started picking up, which has been kind of my MO throughout, um, whenever anybody needed somebody, something, I said, hey, I can do that, right? So news breaks, nobody's available. Lakers signed X player. I'll write that that piece. I'll Let me write that up. I'll hop on it, even though I already did my one article a week. And next thing you know, I'm starting to write the news blurbs for them. And I'm doing those sorts of things. Just being willing to put in that that extra work is uh, it, it's really paid off. And then I, I brought that over to Lakers Nation. They you know, they didn't have anybody to do a podcast. I said, hey, I'm going to be awful at it. I'm going to suck. But give me, a, give me a shot. I'll try it. And uh, and here we are now. The Lakers pod, Lakers Nation podcast has been going on. Uh, gosh, three, four years. We've got a couple hundred episodes in there and uh, and we're still going. So it's um, yeah, it, it's definitely taught me a lot. And and even though I was working for free, like I, I gained so much from it. it. I certainly certainly wasn't like I didn't get anything from it. I, I think I still was compensated just in the knowledge from going through all of that. And during that time, like so you, are you a full time teacher during when you're when you're. Yeah. So what did you give up in your life? Because there's no, there's nothing for free, right? So for you to work for free, do you know, like, did you golf less? Did you, what did you do less of in your life? Because it was that important to you. Do you remember, like, what would be something you would have done that you cut out be, to do that? Sleep, <laughs> mostly, <laughs> mostly sleep. Um, you know, I still try to make, make family time. You know, I, I've got a, you know, my wife and I've got a, a three-year-old daughter now. And, um, and I do what I can to make sure that I still have time with them. But so basically, you know, my wife will, will go to sleep about you know, nine o'clock or so. And then I'm, I'm up till, you know, midnight working on, on Lakers stuff. And that, that standard during, you know, when I'm teaching during the school year, I, I tend to do that. And then, uh, you know, when I'm off for breaks and things like that, then it's pretty much all, all Lakers stuff. I get to focus in on, on that. So that's, that's the way I've gone about it. And it's, and it's worked out. I haven't had to cut out too much but i have had to learn how to go off of uh you know five or six hours of sleep a night which but i'll, I'll tell you what though having a kid teaches you that very, very quickly as well so okay so for you when you so you did that for a year what do you look at something as like your big break or like something that you know oh man this was pivotal in getting to where i am now looking on the path back um, you know what? It was it was really just getting getting picked up by by Silver Screen was was big. Just you know, kind of knocking down doors and saying, "Hey, you know, will you guys give me a platform?" Because that's what everybody's looking for, right? It's just kind of that exposure. And so then once I once I had that, then getting the opportunity to go to Lakers Nation really um, really helped blow it up. And then uh, you know, I think the the moment that really stuck out to me though is is Kobe's final performance, uh, his sixty point game. I wrote something and every once in a while, you know how you, like in sports people say, oh, you're you're in the zone. Right? You just you have a great shooting night or something like that. Um, I, I wrote that piece and it just flowed. It just it just kind of came out. It felt great. And that article did really, really well and, and kind of I, I think it catapulted me to another level because I was able to connect emotionally with with the fan base and relate to what they were going through. And so, um, so I think that piece definitely helped help push me up to that that next level. It's it's certainly the favorite piece, my favorite piece of writing that uh, that I've done. What felt different about that after you posted it? Like, how did you? Was there a reaction? How were you getting this feedback that hey, this was a pretty special piece and it was connecting with people? Um, it, it was mostly people just saying, "Wow, you you know you really nailed the the connection with Kobe Bryant." And I was able to make it. Um, I, I think that that something helps that in writing and in podcasting and everything, when you can let people in, um, when you can can make it personal. And so throughout the piece, I shift back and forth between personal milestones in my life and things that Kobe Bryant had accomplished along the way and along his journey to to becoming an NBA player and just. He's three years older than than I am, and uh, and just being able to say, you know, hey, as I'm graduating high school, I'm I'm in awe of Kobe, who's starting to conquer the NBA, and and kind of making those connections that hey, there's a reason why people care so much about this particular athlete, and that's spent 20 years as a Laker, and so a lot of our own personal milestones came with 
Kobe as the backdrop, as somebody that we were watching and grew up with. And, and sort of making that comparison and that connection, I think, is what really drove it home for fans because a lot of people telling me, oh, yeah, you know, when I was in fifth grade, I remember Kobe did this, this, and this. And, and you know, so it it was building that connection, I think, that, that made the difference. Okay. So so you, that was kind of like your landmark piece. Did you feel, did you see like um, a change in your social media or just... Did that give you like confidence? Like, cause it sounds like you, you pointed to that as the moment. Like, so did you, were people asking for more of that kind of stuff or did, was it not that like cut and dry? No, I mean, people definitely were, were asking for more of that kind of stuff. And so I, I have written a few more things like that. Although lately I've been so busy with audio and video content that I haven't had a lot of time to, to write uh, as much as I used to. But uh, but that type of stuff definitely propelled me forward. And then um, getting into the getting into the podcasting side of things has definitely helped as well. It's given me a, an even better outlet in terms of just getting my voice out there. And then into video, we've been doing that. So it, it's steadily grown from there. But I think that's what, in terms of telling the story, propelled me to that that next level. At least in in my mind, it did. So I want to. I want to ask you kind of about your brass tacks of your, of your mechanics. So for example, when you're writing your Kobe Bryant piece, when he, you know, his last game, he dropped 60, are you, you're watching the game with like a pad of paper and you're like, are you just jotting down ideas? Do you go back and watch it? How do you go from a, an idea to a finished article? What do you do in between there? Yeah. So, uh, like with the Kobe game, I was definitely jotting down some things as we go. If a, if a story grabs me, that's, that's usually what I'll do is I'll jot down a few different notes, a few different places that I want, that I'd like to really highlight and mention. Um, if it's a more analytical piece, um, like I, I wrote one, like one, I wrote a couple of years ago was on Lou Williams and why at the time I thought he was the Lakers best player at that, at that moment, <laughs> breaking down all of the stats for, for that. Right. And that, that was the state of the Lakers back then. <laughs> Lou Williams was their best player and he's great. Don't get me wrong. But um, that was my uh, that was where I was at. So I, I would I'd do all my research, get all my statistical analysis together and uh, and then kind of write it from there. Whereas if it's more of a an emotional piece where I'm trying to make that connection, that nostalgic connection, that's where I'm more hitting like, hey, I want to reference this point in time, this point in time and this point in time. So there's really two different styles there that I kind of can can bring together. And I do the same thing with my videos. I, when I'm making a video, if I'm doing a breakdown um, of a player, I do the exact same thing. I do all my research. I get all of it out there. And then I start piecing it together and figure out exactly how I'm going to transition from point A to point B. And that's just, I think, the most organized way to go about it. But at the same time, I, I try to give myself enough leeway to where if something catches me as I'm writing, I can kind of go off on a tangent and then go back and edit if I need to. It, have you ever written... Uh, or produce a podcast or video like a hot take that like is just you you get into it with people in a respectful way but like what would you say is the hottest take you've ever published where it's you'll get some response from or are you is that not it doesn't seem like that's your main weapon but that's what i'm asking it seemed like if you came out with a hot take it would be pretty interesting sure now the the thing that i get the most kickback on and i don't know why but this is it is but, you know, I've been saying for a while now that, that Rajon Rondo is not good at basketball anymore. <laughs> uh, all the advanced stats show it. And, but there are people who will scream from the mountaintops that he is a great point guard. And you'll see when they get to the playoffs, it's going to be playoff Rondo. And, and hey, I, I hope he's <laughs> great. But that's been the thing that I've been getting tons of kickback on. And, uh, yeah, some people have not been thrilled. They think I have not been very fair to Rondo. I did a whole, I did a whole video breaking down his game and where he was successful and where he was. And people thought I was way too harsh on him. Uh, but that's that's probably my my lightning rod topic at, at the moment. Will you respond to people individually that port you on that or you just kind of let it simmer? How do you when you get feedback like that, will you engage or how do you handle that? Oh, I, absolutely. You know, if they're if they're being respectful. Yeah. And of course, yeah, no, no problem. I'll go back and forth with that. And that's you know, when we do our our uh, shows, we do a live show twice a week. And, uh, and we do that on Mondays and Thursdays at nine o'clock across Lakers Nation social media. So when we do those, I encourage fan interaction. So fans will toss out comments and stuff like that. Uh, and, and we'll go back and forth. So I, you know, I want them to feel like they're involved in the process and they're involved in the discussion. You know, that's what Lakers Nation is all about, really, is, is building that that community of, of fans. So that's been uh, that's definitely something that I'll do. I'll go back and forth with people and 
you know what i'm fine agreeing to disagree with somebody but uh but yeah, that's that's one that I've spent a lot of time on. I'm just laughing. Rondo. There's there's three comments right away. It says he's done. Rondo is trash, and and he's a sleeper. So so, uh, but will you ever lean on that kind of stuff? Like if you know you need to get like a, a, a I mean, maybe you don't have to get a rise, but do you ever lean into that? But it seems like what you do is kind of like straight and narrow. It's like you're you're providing like intel to a community with like story based intel. You're not like trying to like rile people up. Right. Well, and so you look at, so look at what we do, right? You look at, at the content that we provide on ESPN, you've got Stephen A. Smith right? who will, I, I can <laughs> never yell about a topic the way he can, right? Like I'm never going to, going to do that. I'm never going to be that right. And, and ESPN is always going to have a larger audience than us and Fox sports and all the, the different things, right? They're, they're always going to have a wider base to cover. So that means if they talk about the Lakers, they're talking about the Lakers for say three minutes, right? For a quick segment. And then they're moving on. They're going to scratch the surface. And so where we come in is giving fans that deeper level of analysis. So I don't, I don't try to to yell over any of those guys or, or outdo skip on the on the debate shows or anything like that. I just try to provide a little bit more content and more go more in depth into into the Los Angeles Lakers. So that's that's my approach. And it, it's really not my personality either to do a bunch of a bunch of hot takes or anything <laughs> like that. So I try to keep I try to be as fair and unbiased as I can. So it sounds like, so it sounds like your typical like audience is people that just are really passionate about the Lakers and they're not getting the coverage anywhere else. So like, what is a, what's a, a super granular story that you've done? That's something that you would never see on ESPN or, you know, because they can't specialize or go that deep. So we've done, we do a lot of breakdowns, like, um, and some stuff on the local network, uh, Spectrum Sportsnet, they'll do some things kind of uh, like this, but um, a video series I've been doing lately, is called, I'm calling it The Truth. Uh, and so I did The Truth, Kyle Kuzma, The Truth, Jean Rondo, uh, The Truth, Contavious Caldwell Pope, breaking down these guys on, uh, on a video level, looking at, okay, this is where he's successful. This is what you should be looking for if he's going to have a good game and, and things like that, where we're digging in, spending 10, 15 minutes on one player, looking at, at exactly which plays they are finding success with, which ones they're not, why, okay, this guy's shooting percentage dropped 6% this season. Why did that happen? Coming up with those answers. Um, so that's kind of the the type of thing that you can see on there. And then, you know, I, I I look at the NBA as a whole. So I also do another show called the NBA front office show that I do with Keith Smith, where I team up with a, a Celtics fan. And so we covered <laughs> the entire league and go back and forth there. So, so we get to break down that as well. So that's been, uh, been a lot of fun, but yeah, we're, we're able to dig into those stories that, that a lot of the, you know, the big networks just, just can't do that. Okay. So I have some selfish Lakers questions to ask you because one of the aspects of basketball I'm really into and it's exploded the past couple of years is trading cards, right? So how players perform has a direct one-to-one -one impact on how, you know, do these cards skyrocket? Do they crash? So Lonzo ball, you, anal you know, I'm sure you've analyzed them. What are your thoughts on him as a player underrated, overrated, rated, what kind of upside, where do you put him in the grand scheme of the NBA? think he was so overrated coming in everybody thought he was going to be the second coming of jason kidd and this incredible passer and all that but it's it's swung i think now he's actually become underrated since he got traded and all that and he struggled in his first couple of years with injury and and everything that that he's gone through i think at this point people aren't seeing how good he really is and where he makes a difference and so i think lonzo ball's arrow is pointed straight up especially when now he can throw lobs to zion williamson he's in this super fast paced offense i still think he's going to be pretty good especially if and when he can get that jumper fully dialed in i i like lonzo ball because he does have a super unique release and you're like you know is this gonna hang on all right sec can you objectively talk about lebron or will you swing so far into Laker fandom that you can talk, you can't talk objectively about him. Oh, I can talk objectively. You know, LeBron has only been a Laker for a year and a half. I, I have no problem talking objectively about about LeBron. And it's funny, you know, half well, when LeBron first signed, half the Lakers fan base probably wasn't happy because they'd spent so many years rooting against mm. LeBron, and now here he is with the Lakers. So we still see that hang on a little bit. So in terms of, 
I mean, the, the NBA is going to finish out the season. You're, do you think they got a shot? I mean, to take it all. You think they can get through the Clippers? You think, I mean, wh- are they, in your opinion, are they the favorite to come out of the West? Uh, I think it's got to be real close. If they're the favorite, it's not by a lot. It's them and the Clippers are the two teams in the West. In the Eastern Conference, you've got the Milwaukee Bucks. I, I, I think they've got a great shot. And nobody knows exactly what impact this whole shutdown is going to have, right? The suspension of the season, four and a half months, they're going to be gone. Uh, what teams are going to be able to handle that, which teams aren't, which teams stayed in shape, which teams didn't. Everybody is going to drop down a little bit. There's no way to avoid it when you've been you've been sitting on your couch for four months. There, you're not going to have that chemistry and that same rhythm that you had when the season stopped. Uh, but a team like the Lakers, who have championship aspirations, have a veteran team that's very been very dedicated and very focused winning a championship, and you've got LeBron James calling up all the players and staying in their ears about making sure that they're ready to go. Will they be able to deal with that situation to a greater degree than some other teams? I think yes. So, I, you know what? I think they're right there. You look at the lineup they've got. They're in, I think they're in pretty good shape. I, I'd pick them against pretty much anybody in the league right now, but I will say it's not, it's not like they're the prohibitive favorite. The Clippers and the Bucks are both right there too. It's just going to come down to who was able to manage this break the best. So, it- in terms of the greatest of all time conversation, we're coming off the last dance, which I'm guessing as a basketball fan, you probably watched unless you have some like vitriol yeah. towards you. Okay. So where, <laughs> who are your top three? Or if you, let me, let me just, let, let me volley it up for you. You have Jordan, Kobe, and LeBron. How do you order those three? And why? Uh, in terms of, in terms of all time, you know, I think you still have to give that nod to, to Jordan as the as the greatest. I think there are some arguments you can make for LeBron and some and some solid ones, but the knee jerk reaction for so long has been Jordan's the goat, right? He's the greatest, and so uh, to change that perception, it's going to take a lot. And maybe if the Lakers win a championship this year, and now LeBron has a title with three different franchises, then you can shift that around. But uh, overall, I'm going to go go Jordan as as number one. And then I would go, I would put LeBron in, in number two. Um, in terms of the Lakers, I think Kobe is is clearly the greatest Laker of all time. And I grew up as a Magic Johnson fan, um, but I think Kobe is definitely the greatest Laker of all time. But uh, but in terms of what LeBron has done in the NBA and the dominance, the level that he's played at, I can't say that Kobe quite got there. Um, but yeah, so I would go one, two, three would be Jordan and then LeBron and then Kobe. Are you saying like physical, do you say physical dominance because he's able to be as skilled as he is and have such a massive frame and be fast where Kobe, you know, is smaller and, you know, can't play every position. Is that what you mean by dominant or you mean just in a completely different way? Oh yeah. That, that's what I mean. I mean, LeBron just LeBron's able to take over games and, and Kobe certainly could as well, but what LeBron has done, the teams that he has dragged to the finals, you look at some of the guys, uh, that are playing around him. You know what? He he went to the finals with Mo Williams as his second best player at one point. I mean, it just it's ridiculous. And yeah, the Eastern Conference wasn't as good then and everything. But I've always looked at LeBron as he's Magic Johnson with Carl Malone's body, which is is just ridiculous. I mean, it's it's unheard of. And from and from being in the locker rooms and seeing these guys up close, LeBron doesn't look real. He doesn't look like an actual like human being. Like he he looks like some sort of android or something. It, it it's insane. He's I look at that guy and I look at me and I go, we are two different things. We are not the, the same. He is, uh, he's, he's amazing. So, uh, so yeah, I, that's why I think he's had that greater run of, of dominance, just physically, the physicality he brings to the game matched. So you talk about being in the locker room. What, what kind of access have you had over the years? Like how did it start and has it evolved into, is it like a special thing every now and then you get to do, or like, what's your level of interaction, you know, when things are, you know, in the previous state, not the, the new NBA. So when we, so we have with, with Lakers nation, we have a few press credentials for, uh, for the Staples center. And so we're able to go in there and get into the locker rooms and do, uh, do interviews and things of, of that nature, which I've gone and done that plenty of times, but we also have uh, our post game show, which we do live after every single game. Um, so that's where I need to be in studio for that. So that's what I've been doing um, rather than be there, but I do go to summer league and then I'll, I'll talk to all the players there um, I'll bring some players on for interviews and stuff on our our shows. Uh, in fact, the most recent one that I had was uh, was Jared Dudley came on and and talked with us for a while. 
Uh, so that's that's more what I've done. But I, I have gone into the locker rooms and talked with the guys and met with them and and things like that. And that's it's a trip. It's a it's a nice reminder of just just how much of a different level these guys are on not just in terms of, of height just in, but in terms of physicality and just uh these guys are are some of if not the best athletes in the world and just seeing the process they go through before every single game it's it's amazing when can you think of the first time you had that kind of access do you remember do you remember mm-hmm. the first time that happened and how how was that for you that was so the very first time i was in phoenix and at the time, Amir Johnson was a was a Phoenix Sun, and he's walking out of their locker room as I'm walking in, and I just look straight up, and I and I'm looking at just going, oh my gosh, this guy, this is this guy's even taller than than I thought he was, and as he's walking past, I kind of turn to look at them, and then I turn to walk, and I run smack into Devin Booker, <laughs> like I like I run into him, and that is that's like my first as I'm you know I'm not sure what I'm gonna be asking, and hey I'm, you know I've got my notepad with all my little questions and all that kind of stuff, and I run <laughs> into him, and I kind of bounce off of him, and he's like he goes whoa whoa sorry sorry man I said hey no no worries no worries all good, <laughs> and uh, and so that was that was my first experience was literally running into someone. And so someone who's been a huge basketball fan, you cover basketball, was there like a, a starstruck element or did you leave that at the door? Did you like talk yourself to it? Be like, hey, I know I'm going to see X, Y, and Z, keep it together. Or, you know, because being having that kind of access as a huge fan, you know, I know you still have a job to do, but how did you mitigate that? Or did you not mitigate it the first couple of times? Um, there was initially certainly where, you know, I wasn't sure, okay, Hey, is it okay to ask this question or not? Can I approach this player at this point? Especially you're in the locker room before the games and the players are all sitting around doing their thing, right? Now you've got some guys are listening to music. they usually have a TV screen or at least a few TV screens on that are showing one of their opponents recent games. Um, so you're, you know, do you want to interrupt them at that point? Is that okay? Uh, being in the media scrum is a, is a completely different experience as well. So that's trying to navigate that and just figure out what the norms are was, was certainly a challenge early on. And, and there was certainly a little bit of that kind of starstruck feeling to it. But uh, fortunately I was able to, to fight through that, uh, that pretty quickly in it. And I got through it by, uh, I went to Lakers media day and that was when I first, I think it was like my second experience actually being face to face with players. And it was years ago. Um, Eric Black was a Laker at the time. And yeah. Uh, so that so getting to interview 20 players in one day all at one time like you get over that pretty quick do you have a favorite interview of all time that you've done yeah i think you know, one of my favorites has to be avica zubats now who's now unfortunately a clipper but um but avica zubats the very first time at and I was, this was actually at that same media day uh the first time i got to interview him it was like all the other players had this polish to them. Their answers, they knew exactly what to say, how to phrase things and all of that. Avica Zubats had this kind of like in a candy store look. You know, he had just been drafted. Uh, he's coming from another country and all of that. And he just like, as much as I couldn't believe what was going on around me and how cool this was, he couldn't either. Like he was kind of in that that same place. And so, you know, you've talked to so many players about, you know, what their training regimen is like and, you know, what moves they worked on and everything. And Zubat starts going into this story about how in order to train, he watched YouTube. So he was watching old YouTube videos and just trying to copy, copy those. And all the other guys have, you know, their personal trainers and all that. And he wasn't quite on that level yet. So he took the YouTube to to learn basketball. So that, that one, it will always stick out to me. (laughs) All right. Um, As we start to wrap things up here, what, as you progress on, do you have like an end vision of what would make you most happy? Like if this were my day to day for work, this is what I would be most happy doing. Yeah, I mean, I love, uh, you know, Alan Sliwa is a good friend of mine. I see he does like a show for ESPN LA. Uh, he does a Lakers post game show there. Maybe doing something like that, uh, especially with, with him or, or doing something on that level would be great. Uh, taking our podcast to a, to another level would be amazing too. And getting into a, a full-time permanent studio for that and having uh, having that set up. I think that's that's mostly what I'm looking at. Just being able to uh, to do something and, and just really run with it. And that's that's what we're building towards. But, you know, it's still, every time I stop and think about it, I'm like, man, 
I get to make a living talking about Lakers basketball. Like how, <laughs> how cool is it? that? It's just, it's amazing. So I'm, I'm incredibly fortunate to, to get to do what I do. And at some point I want to take it even to the next level and up our production quality and, and up all of that. And that's what I'm, I'm constantly working towards. I can't really say I've got like an end goal in mind. Like, Hey, once I hit this level, I'm good. I think I'm always going to be pushing and trying to improve and trying to make things better. And I, I think if I'm not, once I stop and I say, okay, I'm good now, I think that's a problem. So, so I take that as positive. And so you've been doing this since 2014. How have you seen social media evolve in terms of how it's directly impact how you produce content? Like, is there any, whether it's Instagram or anything like that, is there any, like what's been a major shift for you and be like, wow, this was impactful and this was important to learn or experience? Yeah, it's, it's changed so much, you know, and obviously, you know, Twitter is, is huge. Basketball Twitter is a big thing for us. Uh, but so is, you know, Facebook and, and Instagram as well. But just the way that you, that fans can interact with players is changing the different things that blow up on social media change. But I'll tell you the one thing that I've found out the most is that stuff can get taken out of context very, very easily. It's very easy to have a little clip get taken and your entire point can be completely shifted. And we see that all the time when news gets, gets aggregated. Um, it happens quite a bit. So you really have to be careful with, with what you say and the way that you word things and, and all of that, because uh, you never know who may take it the wrong way. And next, next thing you know, somebody's saying that you said something uh, that you didn't, for example, years ago, I, I wrote an article all about why, um, why the Lakers might want to draft, one player instead of the prohibitive favorite uh, was why the Lakers might consider drafting Dragon Bender over Brandon Ingram. And that was an article that I wrote. And it was just weighing out the pros and cons. It wasn't saying they were going to. Somebody took it as the Lakers are going to. And next thing you know, there's news reports all over Boston because they had the third pick all over Boston citing me as the source saying the Lakers are going to be taking Dragon Bender and Brandon Ingram was going to fall to the Celtics and all these things. And I went, Oh my gosh, like I, that, and that was just a misunderstanding. So uh, you got to be careful these days with the way you word everything. Speaking of people taking things the wrong way, has anyone come up to him like Rondo and be like, man, like, really? You know, like, like read one of your articles. Has, has anyone said anything like that to you? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. I've had, I've had people all the time say, oh, this, this was, you know, Hey, I love this or whatever, but I really don't agree with what you said about Rondo or I don't think this, or, you know, this guy's not the right coach. And that's, that's fine. I'm totally fine with people uh, debating or, or have, whatever. Have like, any that's, players that's said what that it's to all you? about, right? It's about having that discussion. Have any players said that to you? I say that? Have any players said anything to you? No. Okay. I haven't had any players get upset with anything that I've, that I've said or anything that I've written. I've had players like push back on certain things before. Uh, but nothing too, nothing too major. I haven't had anything where where a player's been been too upset with me or or any situation like that. Okay, uh, a couple more quick questions. Do you follow uh, like anything going on with uh, the Lakers 2K or are you aware of all that that whole other world of the NBA endorsing this the esports league? And uh, are you are you aware of that? And then what are your thoughts on that? I'm I'm definitely aware of it. It's not something that I that I follow a ton because I'm so busy just with with all the Lakers stuff. Yeah. Um. But but I'm certainly aware of it. Um. Arash Markazi is always my my go-to guy for that kind of stuff because he's got he's got his finger on the pulse of of that stuff. So, um, the esports and everything. I think it's amazing. I think it's incredible the way things are are taking off and especially certainly something that's needed right now that we've been dealing with a, uh, a pandemic. Uh, I know one of my uh, co-hosts on the the show is uh, Chris, the masterpiece masters, and he's big into that and watching all of those and going on and playing 2k and everything. But, uh, but it hasn't really been my forte. Got it. Are Like, uh, are you aware with like, there's a, there's a handful of YouTubers that have a huge presence from 2k, but it's now, but it's now like blending into the NBA. Are you, do you follow any of that? I, I think that could be, it could be a fascinating I mean, it's a little different now that now that the league's starting back up, but like it could be a fascinating interaction. I'm thinking of you like interviewing or doing an analysis on someone like Cash Nasty Gaming, who's essentially is like the biggest LeBron fan in the world. Are there any like is that you're pretty much you operate on like the NBA like wire? Do you ever like look in the exterior areas of like uh, I guess you'd call it what? engagement or the communities around 
Sure. Yeah. It's something that we've, we've certainly discussed. We've talked about, okay, do we, do we want to branch out our coverage into, I mean, like for example, fashion, right? Like Kyle Kuzma is always wearing something different. Do we want to have somebody who focuses on that kind of stuff, like the lifestyle things? Do we want to have somebody that's focusing on the esports and everything? But um, so far the Lakers are, the Lakers are constantly in the news. I mean, there was a story <laughs> yesterday that that hey, you know, some teams in the NBA, including the Lakers, would like to trade for Bradley Beal. Like, are you kidding me? Twenty nine teams in the NBA would like to trade for Bradley Beal, but they're going to put including the Lakers in there. So even when things are slow, it's never really slow for the Lakers, and that's just it's pulled so much of my time. I haven't been able to get into that, but it's an idea that we've certainly kicked around recently. And maybe as things start to to come out of this pandemic and we start to see, you know, sponsorships and everything like that pick up again, maybe that's something that we'll that we'll move into. Who's the most underrated player that you feel is in the NBA? Not necessarily a Laker, but you're like, man, this this guy is is, is a star, but because he's in a, a small market team or his team's terrible. Like, do you have anyone like that that stands out for you in the in the current NBA that like this guy is a guy? And he just, for whatever reason, doesn't get the attention. Yeah, you know, he's just starting to really get it this year. But I've always been impressed by Pascal Siakam for the Toronto Raptors. Um, he's been absolutely incredible. And he's taken his game to another level. He's been an amazing find for them. So he's certainly somebody. And then and then Brandon Ingram, who used to be a Laker, is now yeah. tearing things up for the New Orleans Pelicans. And, and people are going, hey, this guy's pretty good. I'm like, ah, we were telling you that a year ago when he was a Laker. Um, <laughs> He's uh, he's going to be a real good one too. But you know what? The the league has so many players who just need an opportunity. They just need that that chance, that breakthrough moment. And so there's a lot of guys that are that are out there that I think really could thrive if they were given a, a bit more of a spotlight. And uh, and it all depends on landing spot. And that's why what makes you know things like the draft and everything so interesting is where a player goes, what system they go into, uh, can have a, a real big influence on how their career turns out. Speaking of the draft, you know, I'm a huge Pistons fan being from Detroit. Uh, what do you think of Svi Mikhailu being a former Laker? Are you glad he's gone? Do you think he had some potential? What are your thoughts on Svi? Oh, Svi, Svi was my guy. I love Svi. Svi was uh, absolutely amazing. I got to, to spend a bit of time with him at the Summer League in Las Vegas. His jumper is is just so beautiful. His jumper, it's great. Um, very unassuming guy. And uh, and he told us all about how he he grew up playing point guard. And so we saw little flashes of that every now and then in his game. Like people didn't understand that before that. People didn't know that he did that. Then he shared that with us. And so he, parts of his game made more sense. I was so disappointed when the Lakers traded him. I understood why they did it. But um, but I, I definitely think, think Sfi is going to be a good one moving forward. And his three-point percentage has been, been fantastic this season. So, you know, nothing but the best for him. But he was he was certainly one of if not my favorite players from that summer league team and and he was a fan favorite amongst lakers fans they they love Svi. why did they love him i think it's just because of his his shooting ability and the way he plays the game him playing so hard every single play um there was a moment in summer league where something happened we came down on the offensive end and Svi tried to do something and he like got blocked and he was mad and you could see him get fired up and so he picked up chandler hutchinson of the bulls full court pressured him and forced him into a turnover and the bench goes crazy and he's going crazy. And I'm like, that's, that's the guy, that kind of fight. That's what, what fans are really going to latch on to. And so uh, there's that. And then, and then of course there, it's just undeniably fun for everybody to yell Svee whenever he <laughs> shoots, whenever he shoots that three. So, yeah. All right. And then final question for you, as we wrap up here, if there's uh someone listening right now that wants to get started on the, the journey you've been on, you're like, all right, Trevor, like what's one single piece of like actionable advice would you give them to get started? Like, Hey, I want to, you know, be where Trevor is or some hybrid of that. What would you tell them to do? I mean, the biggest thing that's paid off the most for me is be okay with failing. Be okay with putting yourself out there and trying it and knowing that you're not going to be great at it right away. It's going to take time. It's going to take hard work. So, and you've got to be okay with that and putting yourself out there and understanding that you'll get some negative criticism coming in and you have to be be strong enough to absorb that and say, okay, well, I'm going to learn, I'm going to grow, I'm going to keep improving as I go along the way and, and just constantly be willing to try new stuff and push yourself. That's 
Um, that's been the biggest thing for me. And I, I think that's the most important thing. You know, it doesn't don't grow a following or anything overnight. It, it takes time. It takes a lot of effort and it, and it just takes, um, again, being okay with failing and knowing that eventually you will get better. So if someone's out there and like, Hey, I want to do what Trevor does, but for my local team, whether the bucks or the Suns, what's like, they're listening to this, the podcast is over and like, all right, go do this immediately after to just start doing that. What would you like? Cause I know the landscape's different now. Would you tell them to write a blog? Would you tell them to do a pod? What would you tell them to do? Yeah. I mean, I would be telling them to, to get their information out there, however they want get themselves. If, if they're more into writing then by all means, write. Uh, if they're into to podcasting and speaking on, on air, that's fine. You know, doing video great, uh, but just get yourself out there. And, uh, and you know, you want to play to your own strengths, but you want to figure out what it is that you're good at, but you also want to look at what sets you apart. What is somebody else not doing? Where is there that, that void that you can step into? And maybe it's, it's in a particular company. Hey, they don't have anybody doing deep analysis using uh, advanced anal analytics. Let me go and jump onto this site and I'm going to offer them this type of article. Um, it, it's about seeing where the opportunity is as well. And, uh, and just jumping for it and, and going for it. Cool. Well, Trevor, thanks so much for coming on. And, you know, it's, it's been a, it's been interesting because we bring out a lot of people from like the gaming space, but I just know what you do is so unique. I wanted to bring that on. So people that are interested in following you and everything you have going on, can you tell us where we can follow you, the shows you have going on and where you want people to, to follow you? Or yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Trevor underscore lane on Instagram at Trevor lane, NBA, um, my work's over at LakersNation.com. You can find pretty much 90% of what I do shows up on the Lakers Nation YouTube channel, um, as well as on on the uh, the Lakers Nation podcast feed, which you can get on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever. Um, in just a bit here, I'm actually recording the NBA front office show as well, which you can find on uh, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify it's called and everything. The NBA front and, uh, office yeah. show, if that's what it's called. Yeah, okay. right. And that's with Keith Smith. So you can find that as well out there and uh and dan thank you so much for having me on i gotta say you're you are one of my favorite big brother players <laughs> of, of all time i i loved it I, I loved watching you on there so i appreciate you having me on here man dude of course um real quick what's going on with the pistons front office well, who do you who do you think is going to slide in there you know gosh i don't know at this point who it is that they're that they're going to turn to it's it's going to be something to watch but everything has been so quiet. I mean, like LaMarcus Aldridge had surgery 45 days ago and we just found out yesterday, like everything has been so quiet around the NBA and so focused on that. And I, I think it's going to be a little bit till we, till we know for sure what they're going to do. And then final, final question. How do you think, do you think this hybrid season wrap up? How do you think that, are you hopeful? Are you excited? How do you think, what's your overall opinion on how the NBA is going to complete their season? I think they did a tremendous job. I, I like the way they put things together. I think they made it as fair as they, as they possibly can. You're always going to have some teams that are left out in the cold and that aren't happy about it, <laughs> or some teams that didn't really want to come back that wind up having to, uh, but given the circumstances and, and given everything that we're dealing with right now, I think Adam Silver did a, did a tremendous job. I think Disney world is a great location. I think it offers a lot of advantages. So all in all, the NBA has done a great job, and I can't wait for them to get started up again on July 31st. <laughs> awesome, Trevor. Thank you so much for coming on, man. It was great getting to, to sit down and talk with you, learn your story. And um, I'll be rooting for you, not so much the Lakers, but I'll be rooting for you, and I'm, I'm going to start looking for some, some deep Lakers content. But thanks so much for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks a lot, Dan. I appreciate you having me again. Anytime.